Okay, that brings up another question. Now, who here thinks that it's important to seal the wound with uh, glue at the end of the case? Some of the hospitals we went to, that was a common procedure. Uh, you know, the glue that you get, what is it, Durabond or something, uh, is really easy to put on, and, and you don't even need a dressing once you do that. You just put it on there. So any, anybody up here think that's important? I haven't seen data on that one very right there. No science behind it, but you know. I think the human body, the fibrin gluing, you know, the human body healing. Well, then why do we tell people not to take their dressings off for 48 hours? That's an AORN standard, I think, or something. Some good standard. Was yeah. 48 hours. hours. Why? Um, Sterile dressing for 48 hours. But if, if, if it doesn't make a difference, then why? Well, our understanding is that at 24 hours, the wound edges are. Okay, well, so what happens between 0 and 24 hours? I mean, you could theoretically contaminate the wound then, and so why wouldn't you glue yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's my question. So we should study that. <laughs> we should study that, all right. And we do, anecdotally, we have, when we added it, They did? Yeah. There you go. But we never, we also made other changes. Didn't write that particular <laughs> aspect up. I'm published. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. It's something that we go. I don't think it would be. You know, and surgeons have all, there's lots of us, us, we surgeons can do that's important. Eliminate dead space, irrigate the subcutaneous tissue, uh, non-absorbable stitches in the subcube. You know, we're trained in that. We all know those kinds of rules. but. Uh, you know, I suppose that sometimes we don't do it very well. I mean, hopefully nobody's bringing in drains out of the incision. So that's not a good thing to do. So there are a couple things. But I think uh, I put in your folder one interesting paper that had to do with uh, irrigating the wound in cases of perfs, perf appendix, for instance, uh, irrigating with, uh, you know, an antibiotic solution. I forgot the name. Yeah, and they saw that, that they had a great benefit uh, from that particular. Uh, so that, that wouldn't be a bad idea. But Ash, you had your hand up a minute ago. Well, I was just going to comment on the time of surgery. And uh, we had a surgeon join us, and he, he took a lot, lot longer to do a carotid. I went back and reviewed all our surgeons' carotid, and I found he had two standard deviations more yeah. time than everybody else. And it turns out that he did. Uh, completion angiogram on every carotid he did. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got the machine in and did the angiogram, et cetera, et cetera, and his stroke rate was not any better than anybody else. So we discussed it with him like you would, and we made him stop doing angiograms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's a, that's a good, that's good feedback for us. Yeah, Rebecca. Also follow up on the same topic as what Mike asked. As you know, at our own shop, we um, struggle with not working with the same teams. We have the trainee keys, which yeah. lengthens some time. I mean, I had a pelvic generation with the ortho nurse on Wednesday <coughs> who had no idea about the equipment, and, and that adds a lot of time and efficiency on top of all the, ch the changes. Uh, have we made any progress in terms of trying to get to working at, at least with teams of teams so that it's not this, you know, one size fits all? Yeah, that's very, that's very important. You know, you got a big hospital, it's hard to arrange that. I mean, what most hospitals do is do it for specific types of surgery, liver transplants, heart, heart, kidney, you know, but for your for that kind of case, it probably don't do them uh, often enough that would you know you'd have a defined team for that. But uh, but for team surgery, yeah, yeah, I think that is important. Teams are really important if you can do it. You know, I yes, a couple questions in the back, Jill. Um, so, do, do we have any data on how often our patients come dirty, and in terms of engineering environment, does anybody, are they lucky enough to have a shower for those dirty patients in their own? Because that's what I asked for and I just kind of got laughed. Um, <laughs> well, it's a great idea, but uh, I've never seen that before. So do we know how often our patients, you know, how many cases will be dirty? We just started, we just requested, and it's an easy request, you might not get a yes. We didn't get a yes initially, we had to make a bargain. Uh, we would do something for them in exchange. Um, and uh, to ask the pre-op nurses to ask the patient if they showered, and if so, when and with what, and then record that in the electronic medical record. So we could start pulling it when we pull our SSI data. In exchange, we agreed to look up in advance all their antibiotic risk-coded patients to tell them 
what the patients were coming in with and if they could come out of isolation. So yeah. it's kind of uh, I think that's good. And once we get that, you know, Arcanel's uh, uh, perioperative database, the nursing database, that's got the skin disinfectant data in it. So we'll be able to see that, and I think that's going to be helpful because I otherwise I have no way of getting it. There. As far as the shower, no. We actually had an incident where a liver transplant patient came in very dirty. They put the patient in the woman's locker room shower, and it resulted in a big incident. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm guessing it wasn't a woman. That you put <laughs> That's right. Uh, Peter, you had a question. Um, so, uh, Dr. Novo, one of the keys obviously was an in-depth analysis of these various factors. Number one, how long did that take? Number two, are you continuing that now prospectively to see, oh, now we are redosing antibiotics, are we seeing a correlative decrease in those potentially preventable variables you looked at, and then your outcomes? Well, it took a long time. Jill and Linda did it, and she can tell you. Um, no, we, ha we, we haven't done that yet. Uh, we, we want to make the interventions. We want to start redosing the antibiotics and then actually track that. We're tracking that in the operating room to see if we're doing it. Tracking it with uh, our coordinator to see if they're writing it on the whiteboard and, and then we'll see if it's getting done. We're going to get our diabetic protocol started. It should have been sooner, but they wanted to wait until we switch to the computer physician order entry feeling that we'd have to do it twice otherwise. And the other, uh, the other issues, uh, the correct antibiotic, the correct time, we continue to try and improve that. And I don't understand why that can't be 100%. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't understand why that can't be 100% either. It's, it's something we need to work on as a collaborative and try to do whatever it takes in our hospitals to make sure that people know what the right antibiotics are and that they're used. Well, the, the one thing we do for that is it's a, it's a pharmacy protocol, and they've got the list just like you have handed out, but why it's not followed is another question. You know, I noticed one thing that was kind of interesting, I didn't have a chance to point it out, but if you look at the uh, clean contaminated wound infection rate, you know, hospitals next to each other, and you take the three or four hospitals that are the highest in the clean contaminated infection rate, and then you look at that bundle thing that I showed you, with, with the, they are the same hospitals. So the idea that um, you're having a high rate of wound infection, and then you have all this other stuff, sepsis, septic shock, pneumonia, prolonged ventilation, and re those things, they seem, there seem to be a correlate there. So it's conceivable, and that, in one of the two New England studies I showed you, New England Journal studies I showed you, there were, they also saw that that the, uh, the group that had the higher wound infection uh, also had higher systemic infection. So, I mean, which makes sense, I guess. But, I mean, so you, you go down that path of getting a wound infection, it's not just a matter always, it's not always just a matter of opening the wound. And, it, you know, there's also other problems. But, and the other thing, what about uh, culturing your wounds? Do you advocate that they be cultured? Because it drives Lisa crazy, I know. If we don't, uh, if we don't. percent of the time we don't culture the pus. It helps with the epidemiology if you know oh, right. what bugs are in the pus. Yeah. And you know, the uh, in that New England Journal study, the one from the Netherlands, the nasal study, it was interesting to me. They didn't have any MRSA. Evidently, they don't have any MRSA in the Netherlands. No, they don't. But we do. And. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that it's also effective against MRSA. I think it is, but I don't know. Oh, sorry. Microphone. Well, in that whole effort of search and destroy in the Netherlands and elsewhere, they may have been focused on MRSA and how they had that squeeze balloon effect where they have other organisms overwhelming like VRE. So, you know, there's never anything free.